Oops. Uh, where's my intro? There you go. <laughs> from, from the mighty plasma ball at the center of our solar system, out beyond Mars and Jupiter, boldly going where no man has gone before. Not even Uranus is off limits with the Mythwits. The show dedicated to all things geek pop culture, drenched in absurdity, and coated with sarcasm. Every week we bring you news and interviews from the Geekiverse. We do our damnedest to be funny, but there are no guarantees. Just like the Uranus joke I just told. Last one I'll tell, I swear. Uh, I'm your host, Peter Bryant. Joining me this week is my co-host, Michael Kafis. My God, it's full of stars. <laughs> my other co-host, Jack Ballard. Hello and good evening. And our guest this evening, Fraser Kane. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. Hey. Yes, sir. It's great to have you on. Fraser Kane is the publisher of Universe Today, co-host of Astronomy Cast, and creates the Guide to Space video series. He has been reporting on space and astronomy for almost two decades. Nice short bio. I like that one. I like that. One. People send me really long ones, and I have to. Uh, I think I have to the, cut the more experience you get, the shorter your bio gets. Right. Yeah. Because because the stuff that you actually put in it, the little bit is really impressive, and then you don't have to list like everything. Like, well, I didn't really do much, but I did a oh, lot yeah. of little things. Yeah. So yeah, add up, right? Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. Director, awesome. one of the directors of Cosmo Quest. Anyway, goes on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And you, you sir, you sir, have been podcasting since. Oh my God! Since the beginning, right? I mean, like <laughs> podcasting was still in diapers when you started. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, we just closed season 10 of Astronomy Cast. Wow. wow. Oh, yeah. man. God damn. 10 years. 10. Congratulations. Yeah. And, Thank you so much. And, yeah. So now and, we're, we're moving on to season 11, starting with Off with an Eclipse. Oh, yeah, man. Awesome. So you – so when you podcast and, and you, take a, you take a break, you take off the summer, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. See, Mike? They take a seasonal break. They take off in the summer. Yeah, but they have a, enough listeners that are, you know, dedicated enough to come back. We, we all right. Uh, hey, Fraser. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, Mike, no, you just Mike like, is you... Mike gives me crap. He's like, every time we get up to speed, we take that month off in the summer, and then the month uh, off in the winter. And it we do two months. Up. Yeah, we do two months. No, you take a hit for sure. Like, like the machine is hungry. The machine will never let you stop. It will drag you to your computer and have you answering tweets and Facebook chats and YouTube comments and creating podcasts mm -hmm. and writing stuff until your eyes bleed. So you have to at some point go, this is all a human being can possibly do. And I'm going to go and sit on a beach now and recover. And that's, and so we, we've been doing this for years now. We actually, actually stole the idea from Quirks and Quarks, which is a, a science podcast here in Canada. And they just take the summer off. And, and we just suffer, but at the same time we get to rejuvenate. It's really hard. I'm sure you've seen, it's super hard to try and get yourself to high speed internet once a week or more. If you're doing, you know, for the amount of shows that we're doing, I've got, I'm chained to, to high speed internet. And it's, yeah, uh, yeah. so the summer I just, I just take it all off as it were. Yeah. That you know what? Let me ask you this. You know, we got a whole bunch of questions stuff to ask you, but but I, this is great. So, you know, I have I have some funny stories of, of podcasting over the years of places that I podcast from. Like this podcast is only four years old, but I've been doing podcasting for about eight years. Um, so I've had a couple podcasts that I've worked on, and um, you know, I've I have podcasted from a hotel bathroom. Because my okay. hotel room did not have enough Wi-Fi. It was this crappy place in, in uh, Louisiana. And uh, so I had to go down near the front desk to get decent Wi-Fi. And um, so I basically podcast from my – I was using uh, – at the time we were using Skype and I was Skyping on my phone and I was in the okay. toilet. You know, I'm sitting in the toilet, sitting in the stall yeah. like doing a podcast. And um, – hmm. And, and, you know, there's been a uh, – we uh, podcast from my cousins, a podcast from Hawaii once, I think. Uh, what's what's the craziest, like, situation you've been in that you're like, oh, God, this show must go on? Whoa. Um, <clears throat> we – well, I think the, the most complicated – it's where we're trying to create shows that are more complicated. Like, like we did a show of – where we broadcast a – the transit of Venus and we had people in the desert of San Diego and people 
out in the Pacific Ocean and on Hawaii and all these different places. And we we're trying to sort of pull this whole broadcast together and and be able to to show that. So, uh, man, I, well, and this is I mean, this is part of it is like I've definitely I've, I've been doing live shows from hotels. I've done them from friends houses. I've done them from um, I did them from my then girlfriend, now wife's house. It, it just goes on and on and on. It's just exhausting. It's just and it's so hard on on my productivity. I did an episode of the Weekly Space Hangout from Brian Brushwood's studio, mm. uh, the people, you know, who does a Night Attack in Austin. We, so that was that was nice. He had a nice setup and nice he's got internet. Good digs. So that, yeah. Yeah, so that yeah. was that was yeah. a that was a step up. But uh, but yeah, no, it's <laughs> it's exhausting. And it, and I think, you know, now we're at the point where we've got I still produce I I engineer the shows at the same time that, that I'm actually co-hosting them, but we can have my uh, produ- my editor Chad be able to actually uh, handle the engineering if need be. So it's e- then I don't have to actually be like running the broadcast. I can just be one video stream and included and have someone else actually handle all of the all of that busy work. So yeah, we're we're working on it, right, Mike? Mm-hmm. We got yeah. we got somebody we're working with that. It's possible we may wind up getting in a studio situation where we might have a technician to like run stuff while we actually just do the show instead of me switching stuff and turning stuff no. on and hitting record here. And, you know, like I'm doing like six things at one time I know, you know, while I, I know. do the show. Yeah. People don't realize I am the engineer. I am the host. I am, you know, one of the panelists. I'm <laughs> show wrangler. <you> know, <laughs> show wrangler. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah. And that's, and often it's just my own ambition. is just getting ahead of me where I'm like, Oh, here's a cool thing that we could do. And then, and then nobody else knows how to do it. So I have to figure it out. And then we've, you know, so yeah, that's, that's how I operate too. Yeah, that's that's. Uh, we just started using the Zencaster, and no, they're not a sponsor. Uh, it'd be nice if they would, but uh, we just started using that. So I had to figure that out, and we're we're testing. It's still in the testing phase. Uh, we've done uh, two episodes with it, and uh, we had a little problem with it last episode, but the one before that was fantastic. And I'm hoping this one works out. So yeah, it, it gets crazy. New tech comes out, and you're yeah. like, I can improve the show with this, but yeah, then I got to learn it, and I got to do. Yeah, it and people always want to know, like, you know what technology do you use for the show? I'm like, what, like today? Like, what, yeah. what did I, what did I throw out yesterday? And now I've switched to today. Yeah. I'm constantly swapping out gear technique, trying new ideas out. I'm uh, and all of the people who work with me now, they've just become completely accustomed to it. Like they know that working with me is constant grinding change and to even fight back is pointless. I will, I will have changed everything. Resistance is futile. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right. So, you know, I was looking at looking through the uh, looking through your your information, and I, and I dug around on Wikipedia the Wikipedia a little bit, and uh, it says that that you started Universe Today. That's your first. That's where you got into all of this uh, back in 1999. But the channel itself, the way it looks today, was like 2003. So, how did you get started with with uh, Universe Today? How did that? Um, uh, well, so I used to like back in the olden days, back at the beginning of the internet. I worked for a web design shop out of Vancouver. I was sort of had a lot of big banking clients and power companies and and things like that. And I was giving them advice, sort of strategic advice about how to run a website. But I didn't have any personal experience, and so I figured I should make my own website and run it, and that will give me some experience on, on what it takes to, to run a website, and then I can provide some advice to them. And so I just picked one of my hobbies, and the hobby that was sort of most, you know, the one that I sort of had to spend the most time on, the most fondness for, was astronomy. And so I started running, so I just built my own website, started running it um, on the side, and the sort of learned a mountain of things about how to run a website, how to engage with an audience, that, you know, that, that updating the website is the important thing, not creating it in the first place, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, building a mailing list. And, but I also knew within a couple of months that this is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Like it was really clear to me that, that I found a thing that made me really happy. And uh, so then it was just a matter of being able to do it as a part-time job until I could bring enough revenue from the website to be able to do it as a, as a full-time job. And that was probably 2003 is when I was able to make that transition over and actually make you know my wife was the one who sort of brought in the money and i was you know in the beginning definitely um 
you know, living, I was, uh, you know, relied on her to be able to, uh, to keep the house going. And, uh, but right. over time I was able to make more money from it. And now it's sort of a full-time job for me and a couple of other people, which is pretty cool. Fantastic. Fantastic. Hey, Frazier, could you do me a favor? Um, I'm getting a lot of, Mike and I are both, like I don't know what Jack is, we're getting a l- you were Ciloning I'm, a little I, bit. Uh, am I Ciloning? Yeah. yeah, a little bit. Can you um, up in your adjust bandwidth settings? Can you turn it? Can you crank it down just one notch? Maybe. Sure. I, I, I don't. S- that s- might fix it. I have so much bandwidth, but sure. Yep. It also just might be a. Uh, are you using a USB mic or anything? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes unplug, plug it back in. It might. It might. Uh, yeah. Is it? Sure. Well, let me know if it happens again, and I will try that. It's still doing. Uh, it's still going. It yeah, is still yeah. doing it right now. Okay. Yeah. yeah tech. I love tech. Yeah. I love the hangouts. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why. So anyway, to keep the, I'll, I'll keep going whilst while I'm, yes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my thing while Frazier's doing his thing. Um. So then, so then, you know, uh, so then Frazier moved. He, he's got uh, Universe Today. He's got a website and a YouTube channel. And um, so Frazier, how is the how does the your YouTube channel tie into University? Is it something separate? Is it is it kind of like a feed into it? All right, I just unplugged and plugged my mic in. Does that help? Beautiful. Yeah. You're fantastic. Oh, okay, fantastic. Great. Thank you. Beautiful. Uh, turn it off. Turn it back on again. That seems to be the <laughs> solution as always. Um, everything. E- everything, right? Yeah. So okay. So back in the day, early on, you know, we reported all our news in text because that was sort of the way that you did it. But but I could see, and, and there weren't a lot of places where there was space news coming out. But then uh, you could, I could start to really see that there was a lot of other kinds of media out there, podcasting and eventually video over on YouTube. And and they were good for a lot of things. And I found that, that one of the problems that I'd always had was that I was – Nobody kind of knew who I was. Like I was writing, I had tons of people reading the website, but there was no real kind of connection with the audience. And so the the sort of theory that I had was that by, you know, switching over to podcast and eventually to, to video, I could build more of an engaged community, more of a connection with the audience. And something that was a little less, I guess, of a... Um, you know, ne- even now, like if you do a search for recent news... SpaceX launches, things like that. Literally thousands of websites come up. It is impossible to sort of rise above the above the crowd. But if I could build a sort of dedicated audience that was following the things that, that I was talking about and sort of subscribing on a regular basis, that felt a lot more sustainable over the long term. And so that was why I sort of pushed myself to kind of figure out these other media, both, you know, first podcasting and then five years later figuring out out video. So it was just a matter of trying to respond to the kinds of stories that I could see people were really resonating with and kind of the way of delivering it that people really liked and a way to sort of build more of a connection with the audience. So that's why I made that transition over over such a large amount of time. And the video is the newest one. And the video one has just been like a, a brick wall of knowledge to try and learn and, and overcome. If you, if you go back, you can literally go back to the first videos that we did, you know, and you can you can just move through and you can watch us learning how to do things step by step as we as we proceed up until the videos that we're releasing now. I tell you, you know, uh, they talk about how to st- stave off like uh, dementia and Alzheimer's, and it says, you know, try and learn something new. I'm like, dude, start a podcast. That's <laughs> yeah. all you got to do. Yeah. <laughs> Your brain will never stop being yeah. filled with with crap. Yeah. Your brain will work until the day you die if you live to 120. Yeah, absolutely, definitely. <laughs> hey, I want to make sure we save a little time because I want to uh, put some education out there. I want to um, really talk about some of the basics and some of the more advanced and interesting facts about the um, the upcoming eclipse. Um, sure. And also, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on too is, uh, Fraser. one of the things I found is when I was just looking for information myself about the um, eclipse, I was finding so much – uh, flat Earth deniers are taking an <laughs> advantage of this as a topic to to go to the front of the line in this, and I just was wondering what uh, maybe advice you had to help us with uh, our listeners if they wanted some more accurate information where they could go. Um, well, obviously, NASA on is astronomy the best. cast. <laughs> Yeah, we did a whole episode on the upcoming eclipse and just sort of how to get ready for the eclipse and what to see and what to do. 
Uh, now this is theoretically because I've never seen a total solar eclipse yet. So uh, a week from now, I'm sure my advice would be a lot better. But uh, but NASA, I think, is is by far the best source of material that's out there. I mean, they've you know they produce a tremendous amount of amazing material. Um, uh, you know, we rely on that on their calculations, on their on their predictions for when you know different times we're going to see different uh, parts of the eclipse, etc. No, they're the they're the place. Yeah. You can, like search for NASA eclipse on on Google, you'll you'll be buried in information, especially on this eclipse. I mean, they're really working hard. Okay. Well, I have to know, what are the flat earthers saying? I mean, how, how, how the fuck are they spinning? I mean, really, how are they spinning this? How, how can you say, all right, well, yeah, this is, we're going to, right, let's, how can we figure our way out of this one? <laughs> how could something you know? that is revolving around something else, but they, they, <laughs> they do, they have, they can't, how do they do it? Yeah. You know, they are trolls. In my, in, in my, you know, I think yeah. they're trolls. I don't think they actually genuinely believe it because there is so much evidence to the counter to it. Uh, like you can take a flight from uh, New Zealand to Buenos Aires in nine hours or whatever, right? Like that just destroys the theory. You can go get on that airplane and catch that flight. And so that's like, that's it. Done. Broken nothing else needs to happen. And so, and so if you're t like, if you're talking to a person, you provide like that piece of evidence, like what else have they got? Right. 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 So, and so, they're like, and they're like, you know, they're like, well, you know, we don't have access to like satellites and we can't, you know, we can't fly our own planes up to this stuff, you know, and they, and they know that I'm like, dude, all you need are two sticks, two sticks and, and, and your cell phones. Yeah. And then, one of you go to New York, one of you go to DC, each of you put the damn stick in the ground and look at the shadow at the same goddamn time. Yeah. All right. That's all you need yeah, to do. You, right. So, and so, did this. They need and to so start they're just trolling. They need to start a Patreon and everyone, all these idiots just kick out five bucks and buy a rocket. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I, SpaceX I've, and just rent I've and send heard. like. Find five representatives to send yeah. up there and confirm yeah, no, I've it. Heard you they, know what they're I mean? trying to raise money to do a uh, flight over Antarctica to get to the wall. Yeah, so oh, to get to the wall. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that would do it. But the, right. So the, my point is, I don't. I I actually think that the number of people who actually believe in flat Earth is is pretty low, and I think they're trolling. And I just you know like. I just don't have the time of day. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna refute them because it's pointless. Yeah. I'm. I'm just gonna have conversations with the people who love space and science and and share my interests in the love of the universe. And I don't have time of day really to have debates with people who are not willing to listen to evidence and reason. Like, what is the point? There is no point. So, meh. I just ignore it. There was this guy dressed in black furs, and he was talking about the wall, but he kept saying, winter is coming. So I don't know. <laughs> All right, bad joke. Right. <clears throat> anyway, uh, so so what – you know, if, if people – you know, Mike is traveling – down to uh, to North Carolina, and he's going to be in the, in the in the path of totality. Yep. Uh, I am not. I I just can't, I can't make it. I'm going to be trying, here. I keep trying to grab him. I was like, "Come on, man! I got wow. you, man! Come on down!" I know. No, I know. it's 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 yeah. just not going to work. Um, so. So if if people you know because if people are down there of course they're gonna see you know they're gonna see the full effects gonna be great and you can find out all kinds of stuff about that but what if you can't make it I mean what if you're you know if you're in a, in another state and you're you're not going to get the full effect you know say you're I don't know four hundred miles north of that what uh, what how's it going to be for for somebody who's you know still say in the United States because I know you're in Canada but still yeah. say in the United States on the East Coast uh, up around the Baltimore New Yorkish area How, how's that going to be for us. If you are that close to the eclipse path and you're not doing it, like I'm, I don't understand. <laughs> Pete, right? Pete, just just uh, blank yourself out for a while. You're you're you excused from the conversation now. Yeah, like it just it just seems like 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 from what I understand. Not, I mean, I, I, obviously, I haven't seen it, but it is a a you know, it is a amazing experience once in a lifetime something you cannot describe and will haunt your imagination for the rest of your life and there are those who have seen eclipses and those 
who who haven't and and those who have now you know travel the world uh searching out that next eclipse so you know i think that from what i you know from what i hear about what that experience is like is sort of otherworldly ghostly sort of landscape around you and suddenly it gets cold and the birds stop tweeting and you see this ring of fire around the the edge of the moon and yeah i i don't know what to tell you man like like really you're gonna because you're, you're 400 miles away you're gonna like no. well you know it's it sounds good but Dude, no, how get... far are we, Mike? It's two how days. Far is... It's two days. All you need to take off is two days. We're gonna. It's just Monday for the eclipse. Tuesday yeah. to drive back. Yeah. So if you are so so, really anybody who is in the entire United States and anybody who is in really most of Canada should have or be making their plans to to get down there and. And I've been nagging about, I've been nagging for a year, right? Like do it, set it up, figure it out. I don't care how. So, all right. So, so let's say for some reason you can't do that. Well, then what you can do is you can, yeah, you can, you can go and you can watch a live broadcast of it on the internet and, you know, and see a pale shadow of, of what it could be. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> Now, now, I'm I, being science shamed. Great. <laughs> yes. You could also, you could also, you're going to experience partial, a partial eclipse in your location, right? Have you, have you been through a partial <laughs> eclipse before? Uh, a long time ago. Yeah, Very they're boring. Yeah, I think so. I yeah, one they're boring, cool. right? Like the yeah, the the sun gets things get a little dimmer for a little bit there, and if you've got like eclipse glasses, you can see a little chomp taken out of the sun, yeah. but it's nothing really special. Yeah, but what if okay? What if it's overcast down there? What if I travel all that way? I take two days off of work that I don't have, and Not and true. I go down there and it's overcast. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, that that but, that that's gonna that suck, would suck. But, but yeah. uh, so what yeah. about? <laughs> <laughs> and you will have yeah. spent two days yeah, with you Mike. Yeah, I'd have spent two days with Mike. Well, four yeah. days, don't forget, <laughs> Saturday, Sunday. Anyway. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, yeah, I can't well, go Dude, I... What do you do, right? <laughs> yes, yes. You could take a risk and the risk could not pay off. Yes. Or it could pay off. I mean, an eclipse in the summertime? In like August? Like, what better time for weather are we possibly going to have? Like, this is it. So, yeah. so I, I consider I, it. Yeah, I would, I would certainly yeah. consider it. Yeah, yeah. It, and you, you do make sense. you, you are a good advocate for this solar eclipse <laughs> yes, thing. <right. laughs> I know yeah. you're selling right. it. So, yeah. you must. I'm you getting must a cut from cut from big from, from big yeah. solar. <laughs> so I, I, I want to talk reason right, right yeah. now. I want to talk reason and I want to talk realistic because uh, this is a a chance for a lot of people who have concerns to uh, amp them up way too much than they need to be when it comes to, like you were saying, a very narrow band of the United States. It, there are a lot of people coming from both sides are going to be coalescing in this, this uh, you know, 60 mile yeah. uh, or so yeah. uh, area. So uh, what are some realistic concerns and um, what would you say uh, – Things to consider versus yeah. some of the things that are just a little, uh, let's say, Y two K ish. Right. Well. Well. No. Okay. So I mean, obviously, <laughs> I mean, eclipses happen several times a year across the whole planet, solar and lunar. Nothing is going to happen to the planet. We're not going to have any great spiritual awakening. Uh, <laughs> we're not going to open up the seventh seal and let loose the Lovecraftian horrors from beyond uh, our universe. That's it. I'm out. I'm out. Forget it. Though. Right. Right. <laughs> Not with I know, that. I know. <laughs> but, um, but no, I mean, I think you're, it is possible. Okay. So like all the good places to stay are gone. All the places to camp are gone. So. Not my mamas. So you, if, if, <laughs> if you know somebody who lives on totality, you are set. So take, please ignore all of the advice I'm about to provide because you're done. You've, you've got it, right? Uh, even we're, you know, we're in St. Louis uh, for the eclipse. And so we're about 10 miles off the totality path. So even we have to sort of enter into the fray to try and get our buses under the totality. But if you can get there, perfect. Um so you got to be prepared for the mother of all traffic jams, right? Like mm -hmm. that, that, as you said, you know, some significant portion of, 
of all of our countries is going to try and get to this 20 mile wide path across the United States. It's going to be a nightmare where you are over on the East Coast. It's going to be reasonable in the interior. It's going to be pretty bad on the West Coast uh, where I would have gone. You know, if you're coming from Canada, make sure you get across that border days in advance and bring supplies. You know, it's, it's going to be August. It's going to be hot. So anticipate parking your car and sitting and drinking cold beverages and waiting eight hours to be able to get to a point where the where the traffic settles down. Like it's going to be I think that's the big key is that you just need to have a really well supplied vehicle that's going to help you get out of there without you stressing out and overheating and just going crazy. So that's that's it. And I think the cool part about it though is it doesn't matter where you go. It's on no special place. You just have to get to that pathway and then look up and just watch it happen. What about like um, logistics like cell towers going down or uh, no, things like that? We don't No. Mm-mm. No. Okay. no. Sorry mom. No. I, <laughs> you're sad your your, sat, me, your, your uh, you know your solar panel will be a little less effective for a, for a few minutes. <laughs> no, I mean like but cell phones like all those people maybe making calls or things like that. Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, I think, you know, there's there's a lot of cell phone coverage, you know, maybe. But, you know, when you think about it, like that number of people accessing cell phones, I don't know. I don't know. Don't try to make a lot of calls. Don't really, you know, enjoy the spectacle of nature, yeah. Yeah. not the, uh, the coverage. And I think the other part is to make sure you've got the right safety equipment because I am sort of legally bound to remind you that looking at the sun with the unaided eye is uh, incredibly dangerous. Looking at the sun with any kind of... Um, Do you need these? Yeah, any kind of telescope or binoculars or anything yeah. will blind you instantaneously. So um, so you need some kind of, of good, well-rated, you know, the properly rated um, glasses. And then uh, you, can, you can look at it with without glasses at totality for about two minutes but the rest of the time you need to have those those glasses on right right and steve all right so fill me in on this a little bit maybe you've heard of this uh we're buddies with steven rams i don't know if you know him he's been down at dragon con a bunch he's uh, uh works with the charlie bates solar found or solar astronomy um dot org uh, but anyway he's he's a, a big non-profit solar astronomy guy um and he, he gets these glasses. I think he's given out, I think he was saying like a couple hundred thousand of these mm. things for free because, you know, he gets, he gets donations and stuff. And, um, he was, he's been monitoring all of these people scamming with like fake glasses. But then at the same time, uh, there's been a bunch of recalls yeah. that are not necessary because he said those glasses are actually fine and people are having to return them, but they don't because they're they're okay. Uh, have you heard anything about the the whole glasses? Debacle? Yeah, I haven't I haven't looked too too deeply into it, but that's what I've heard that that Amazon is, is, has recalled a whole bunch of glasses because they weren't necessarily the right rating. But I don't know whether they're safe. I mean, my assumption would be to not trust them, right? If they're if they're if they don't have the the um, what is it? I S. Oh, I forget the the term, but there's like a there's a there's a rating that you need to make sure that they have on the on the glasses. Let me just get that up. Um, I got mine here. H is it? HP something? Yeah. yeah. I've uh, while you guys are looking for that. HP four fifty or something like that. I, I'm uh, anyway, go ahead, Mike. I want to try, uh, and it's it's more difficult. I haven't. Uh, I've been reaching out, and uh, I, I obviously uh, schools are busy. I've reached out to um, a couple of uh, colleges in uh, Greenville, and uh, just to say, you know, hey, are you guys having any um, get-togethers? You know what I mean? Because where I'd like to be is a place where we can be outside, not necessarily have to have an observatory. But uh, where they'll have a live feed just in case yeah. it is overcast so that we can, yeah. like you were saying, access um, the uh, NASA feed yeah. because they'll, yeah, have, they'll really... have stuff flying over and, and capture that. Yeah, there's some really cool stuff that people can build. Uh, if you've got a telescope, you can put like a funnel over the end of the telescope and then you, it's called a, you know, a solar funnel. And it's a way to sort of broadcast what's going on with 
with the sun and like a lot of people can look at it um, and then if people have solar telescopes there's these uh, really great different a bunch of different kinds of, of solar telescopes that are designed to look at the sun and they're going to be great to see so okay. it, you know if you have a friend who has a solar telescope or solar filters attached to their telescope it's a that's a great time to see it so I've got the number here so it's ISO um, one two three one two dash two so that is the ISO specification that should be on your sunglasses. I don't know if you see those, Pete, on your on the side of your oh, of your glasses. Yeah, I don't know. Mine co- mine came from Stephen Random himself, so I know these are. We good. trust the he sun spent god. So much, he is the sun god. Yeah. We, we ta- yeah. We, yeah, he knows what he's doing. And, yeah. So he gave these to me personally. And also, yeah. for anyone else, I'd like to thank uh, Dad Game John in our chat room because he uh, gives gave is. Uh, posted us the link to uh, the safety site on NASA, which is eclipse2017.nasa.gov forward slash safety. And you will get all the information you need as far as uh, everything you need to know about uh, safely viewing the eclipse. Yeah. So I want yeah. to thank him for that. Yeah. And once again, you know, we were, we were sort of nagging people again to get their hands on that, you know, because they're not expensive. I mean, you could pick up a, a pair of, of glasses for, less than a dollar. I mean, and they're I, not expensive at yeah. all. And I'd also like to point out to Dave in our chat room that yes, in fact, tanning will be affected during the eclipse because yeah. a big body will be between the sun and the earth, meaning that some of those rays will not reach us during that yeah. time. So yes, yeah. will not be able so to Dave, tan yes. so much. Yeah. No. Go with your nighttime <laughs> tanning regimen. Yes. Right. (laughs) Even if you have one of those, like, you know, you see in the movies where they got that thing and they got, you know, it's got the panels and phone. That's not not going to That's You don't need, no, no, not the kind of glasses with the little slits in them that you wear in the tanning salon. Those are not solar uh, approved. Not going to work. No, no. So I have a quick question. Over the weekend, I saw the uh, classic James Bond film Moonraker, and I couldn't happen to uh, not think about what would this look like on the moon if we actually had a moon base. What would this? Uh, what would this event look uh, like? Well, okay. So if you're on which side, right? The moon is tidally locked to the Earth. So let's just say that you're on the side that is facing the Earth. So you are obviously going to be in shadow because the moon, the sun is going to be directly behind you. So you're going to, everything's going to be dark on your side of the moon, <clears throat> but you're going to see the shadow of the moon as this, as this circle mm-hmm. appear on the side of the earth, sort of out on the Pacific ocean, out beyond uh, the side of the United States. And then it's going to move across the United States as it, until it gets out into the Atlantic Ocean and then sort of oh. fades away as the as the alignment ends. So so it is a it is you know seen from space it is a it is a circular shadow that races across the surface of the of the planet Earth at about two thousand miles an hour. Now, if you hold your thumb oh, out, will it be about the size of the wow. thumb? Will that is that about the size I'm of the like, real? I'm that, trying that to think shadow. Of yeah, I'm trying to think like like because from Earth the Moon is the size of the thumb. It's the size of your pinky. No, it's the size of your pinky fingers thumb, the fingernail held at arm's length. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah, or the size of a dime held at arm's length. Yeah. Oh, right. do it. And and you know what's funny? A lot of people don't realize this, but no matter where the Moon is, you know, like the Moon looks like it's bigger when it's on the horizon. Your pinky finger will still cover it at arm's length. It's mm-hmm. it's this quick crazy. Yeah, it is an like it's the way thing. your eyes work. Yeah. Yeah, it's neat. Yeah, try that. Try that experiment. Um, like at the same time, when you see the moon, you're like, "Man, the moon is so big!" Like, hold out your arm, arm's length. See how your your pinky nail covers it, and then wait until the moon looks so small, way high up in the sky, and do it again, and you'll see that the moon hasn't changed. It's just you went crazy. Right. <laughs> it's the craziest optical illusion. Oh, it's wild. <laughs> right. Yeah. There was a time in there where you were a werewolf and you didn't even know. I knew so, it. So, so Fraser, if Oh yeah, we didn't even get into. Will Superman lose his powers? And <laughs> Superman <laughs> will. Superman will lose his powers. Uh, but it is it is like the opposite of of a werewolf's full moon, right? Like it might actually kill all werewolves when you think about it, because Ooh. right? Because it's the opposite of a full moon. It's a new moon. But even yeah, so that's that's my feeling. I don't know. There's right. 
So so werewolves run from the path of totality. Yeah, they don't like, want to be in any part all talking. Of, a, of, a, of a total solar eclipse, yeah. So if, if you go on on Wolf Wolf Chat I, I do think Wolf Chat that, dot uh, alt right now, yeah. there's probably they're all talking about yeah. it. Don't go here. Yeah. <laughs> Great, we just lost half our listeners. Thanks, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> the, so, the werewolf. So, so I have a question. You know, like you see these like Bond movies and stuff, and like they're gonna take a giant magnifying glass and they're gonna put it up. And they're going to burn the Earth with the sunbeam that comes down, like maybe through like a satellite or something. Could we freeze sections of the Earth using the moon shadow? Go. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> huh. uh, yeah, yeah. Wow. That that was, yes. I just, that it will get cool. Yes, you could. You think? It will, it'll get right, colder, right. right? So it'll be, it'll be as if it was nighttime. So, you know. But yeah, that, that, just like your that, nighttime that's the carrying part. rules apply. Same thing goes with your shaded moon shaded <laughs> Earth destroying plans go are, yeah. are all a go. Yeah. All right. Well, Pete, right. unless you have any other uh, cheesy villainous uh, ways to destroy the Earth right. using the moon, um, I'd like yes. to. Uh, I mean, Fraser is uh, an awesome uh, scientist. He uh, a science communicator, but he also uh, has something in common with us. There's a whole other Venn particular diagram that just overlaps with us which is he is a mega role player superstar so i'd like to spend right. some time really uh delving oh, into wow. that if we may if you're done sure. again destroying the earth with the moon superpower right yeah we're gonna, we're dropping the bottom out of this should I, yeah, should Fraser, I, should I some dice? <laughs> you don't need to uh, but yeah, we have we have a large. Actually, our show has a large gamer community. I think our gamer community is probably our biggest community. So they're going to be really interested in hearing, uh, you know, where, where some game designers go when they stop designing games. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to space. <laughs> to space, right? Right. So, so yeah, you worked on uh, you worked on uh, Shadowrun, mm -hmm. right? Yep, I worked on Shadowrun, uh, Earth Dawn, so a bunch of stuff for Faza. GURPS. And I did a GURPS yeah. supplement, and yeah. there was another kind of GURPS supplement that will never see the light of day. And uh, uh, yeah, so I think I worked on five or six books altogether over the run that I was doing that back in, man, like early 90s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. it was it was funny. So I was really lucky. So I like I, I've been a role player all my life. I've organized conventions, played, you know, D and D all that since I was probably grade five. Um, and when I, so I, like I said, organized these game conventions. And then when I was 18, 19, I got a part-time job at the comic book store in Vancouver. It's called the comic shop. And I was the game guru. So I was the person who staffed the game area of the of the store and sort of gave people, you know, explained and gave people advice and did all the orders on the games that we we're getting. I got into Magic the Gathering super early on. Actually, that's a whole other story. Um, but uh, yeah, and so one of our patrons was this guy named Nigel Findlay, who, if you go and look at all your Shadowrun books, he wrote half of them, uh, as well as stuff for stuff for D and D, stuff for White White Wolf. Just he wrote, he was a machine and wrote a huge chunk of of game books out there, and was a great guy and really good friend and. You know, I sort of got to know him and he sort of he was a mentor for me and sort of taught me sort of how the industry worked and agreed to work on a couple of projects with me and sort of helped me really get my footing in the in the industry. So I got this huge jump up for being able to work in that in that industry a lot earlier than I ever would have had to, you know, had to slog it out the hard way. It, <laughs> right. Yeah, it's too bad. Nigel, Nigel passed away in 1995. He had a. Oh, yeah, he had shoot. a heart attack and died in 1995, just as he was sort of transitioning to novels and working on screenplays. Like that was his big plan was to, was to write novels, which he did a bunch of novels for TSR and, <clears throat> and was going to be working on screenplays. And then he, he passed away. So it's a real yeah. it's a real shame. Damn. Yeah. But a <laughs> lot of the lessons that I learned from him really taught me, uh, really stuck with me for all the writing that I do today, all of the. You know, I write tons and tons and tons today, and all of those lessons were, you know, I learned really early on with with him. So, 
Wow, wow, that's pretty neat. So you, uh, so you got out of of doing game design eventually um, because the money was just, it was was so tempting that money. <laughs> yeah, how did you how did you get away from all the money you were making? Sweet game design money, yeah, <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I got busy with no, so right, so I sort of took a side route through working for software companies. And so I sort of started a couple of software companies and although the money wasn't great for that back then either, um, <laughs> it's a lot better now, but, uh, uh, but yeah, just got, just got busy and distracted, but we did keep playing. You know, I did, uh, had an Ars Magica group that we played every week for must've been a decade. Uh, we played a, a pile of games. I got an Ars Magica kicking around behind me somewhere. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, so I've got, uh, you know, and then we did D&D. When it, I, up until a couple of years ago, we were still doing pretty much a weekly D&D group. So, uh, right, yeah, we have a group. Uh, let me let me ask you, so you maybe you, you may say D&D, but what is your favorite system to play with? Uh, well, I'd say my favorite system is Art Magica. Okay. Yeah, if I had to pick, if I had to sort of, my happiest experiences were in Art Magica. And you, you sound yeah. like you're you also know, a, a played... fantasy uh, genre as opposed to uh, like a cyberpunk ish. Yeah, I mean, we played a lot of. We did some Star Wars. We did some cyberpunk stuff. Shadowrun, obviously. Um, but yeah, I think I prefer the fantasy genre most. If I had yeah. to sort of pick, I'll let it and slide. of those, <laughs> what, what should I be <laughs> playing? Know. You play what you want to play. Like buddy. A cyberpunk. I mean, you know, yeah, play what you want to yeah. play. <laughs> play what you want, as long as it's traveler. As long as it's classic traveler. I saw on the list that you play video games as well. What's that, Jack? I, I saw on the list too that you said you play video uh, games. Ooh, uh, what video um, games? Let's see. What am I playing right now? Um, I, I like a lot of the paradox stuff. So I play uh, Europa Universalis, Stellaris. Um, I like. I'm very good at Don't Starve. Um, man, what else? Oh, oh I'm not good at that too. Yeah. Well, let's see. <laughs> oh, if you saw what have I got belly? recently? Uh, yeah. I finished Darkest Dungeon, although that was sort of. I'm not sure why I did that. Um, uh, what else have I played? Are these like Steam games? Are mm-hmm. most of these like Steam, Steam games? Yeah. Or? Yeah. I'm, I. We, okay. uh, I yeah. almost finished The Witcher, which I'm sure everyone says that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm like 50 <laughs> hours in, game. 60 hours yeah. in. I feel like it's close. Fantastic. I feel like I'm almost there. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, man, what have I played a lot of? Yeah, I would say if I look at sort of the to- the games I've spent put the most time into, oh, the Mass Effect series, of course. I finished. All right. I finished all of those. Oh yeah, um, huge. Uh, I did you play Andromeda I got about yet? two hours into Andromeda and then just stopped playing, and I feel yeah. super guilty about that. You should. Yeah. I felt the same way. I kind of gave up on it for a while because it gets real sloppy in the middle. But uh, it's worth well, it. Well, part of the problem for me is that, uh, that I really like to play a lot of these games on my TV. And so I usually stream from my Steam machine mm-hmm. to my TV using a, a, a Steam link. And then I can play like mm-hmm. with a controller. And that ran through Origins and didn't support it. And I was just like, I don't want to take the time to figure this out. So uh, I played a lot of Fallout. Um yeah. Uh, oh, I man. love Fallout too. Yeah. I have one thousand games in my Steam library, so uh, holy shit! <laughs> yeah, I, it's possible I have a problem. Um, uh, XCOM. I love the XCOM games. Yeah. I beat all of them. Um, those are those have got to be my favorites. Uh, yeah. I got I got to ask. Mobile gaming. No. Oh, no. <laughs> well, so, an adult, Mike. yeah, I played a few <laughs> mobile games back in the day. I really liked like there's like some tower defense games that I really enjoyed, um, but I really dislike the sort of the the free to play model and mm-hmm. with the with the microtransactions. And I've you know, yeah. you get this sense of when a game. Well, I'll give an example here. So I don't know if you guys play World of Warcraft. I played a ton of that. And one day I had this this sort of epiphany. I'm like, wait a minute. Like, I'm literally just spending my valuable, precious life force to switch numbers in a database. 
right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not enjoying myself. I'm I'm enjoying the fact that database numbers have gotten switched, but but I'm not enjoying my time spent. And so I immediately stopped playing World of Warcraft, or I stopped playing any single player stuff. And all I did was just did Guild Raid. So if we're doing Guild Raid and we're working as a big team, that was a riot. I always right. enjoyed myself. So I, I showed I showed up for yeah. those the teamwork and the social, and I didn't care if I got if anything. If, I, if my character improved in any way, shape, or form, I don't care. And that, you know, back in the day, I was I was very much interested in that. That used to tickle a part of my brain, you know, that that says, oh, you should you should acquire more and improve your character and get better and so on and so forth. And and I, it was even in like role playing games like D and D or as Magic and things like that. I'm like, oh, you know, I can't wait till I hit the next level. And then after I realized, you know, like wait a minute, all, everything just resets. It's all just the same. The yeah. everything scales up. What matters is the stories you tell and the fun you have with your friends. And so I started making characters who were worthless, yeah. who had no ambition whatsoever, uh -huh. but were a, just a boatload of fun. To play and to and to be a part of of the group, and I started to sort of go that way with with the video games that I play as well. And so if I if I see a game ever need me to grind, I'm out. And I find a lot of those mobile games are in that vein where you're just like yep. you know oh how many do buy, how many donuts can I use to buy the Quickie Mart right? Forget it. That's Mike's not, game. It's Mike's not joint. gonna do it anymore, right? <laughs> Because I'm, I've, I've only got one life to Hi, live. Hi, my name's Mike. I'm a grinder. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Hi, so Mike. I, I wrote a whole, I wrote, I wrote this big blog on that. Actually, uh, I have a, a blog that I write called Gearhead Gamer, and it's, it's just about concepts in gaming, not any game in particular. It's just design aspects and just, just games in general. And, but it's from a real, like, like mechanics gearhead perspective. So it's, it's getting into the crunchy, how the games work, uh, and concepts and stuff. And one of the concepts I did was an, is, uh, playing with no XP, playing with no experience, you know, run a campaign where you do not award any experience. You let people make up the hero they want to play. And that's what they get. And if they want to make changes or they want to advance in some things here or there, it's just done through gameplay. My guy studies to do this. Okay. Uh, after a couple of sessions, you have it now. Right. You know, there's no experience spent. You didn't level up. You just got this new thing. Yeah. Um, and then that way, my argument was you can concentrate on playing the game, telling the story and having fun. You don't have to worry about leveling up. You don't have to worry about getting experience points. Just play the damn game and have fun. Yeah. And that was my argument for that. And yeah, because you level up, you get more, oh, I got all this new stuff. Okay, now the DM has to send better monsters at you. So you didn't really change much because yeah. you're not really <laughs> kick-ass anymore because the monsters you fight are kick-ass. And if they weren't, you'd be bored because you'd say, well, everything I fight, is I can just wade through it. Yeah, and I find that that is a very insidious path to go down and because i find like it really connects in with dopamine receptors in our brain and yes. says you know the quest for more and i've been able to sort of harness that that instinct for the other stuff that i do that exists in real life so uh i really enjoy the logistics of preparing to do a multi-day hike or I really enjoy, or I'm willing to grind and answer a thousand questions on my YouTube channel because I know for each one of those, there is a tangible, real life impact that's happening to me. And, and so that's all is, is that whenever I find that, whenever I notice that I'm trying to, I'm starting to scratch that itch in a video game, I figure out how I'm going to, to sort of transition that over into, into real life where it kind of actually matters. You, you you can yeah. turn life into a video game in that same way, yeah. and those right. you're actually helping learned. people with that too. Yeah, well, exactly, right. So those lessons learned are are very important to then take that those I don't know, skills <laughs> to <laughs> to real life, right? Because a lot of the time, a lot of life is to get the things that you really want to do, to get the the to get the achievements in life that you want. You have to be willing to do hours and hours of mindless scut work. And that's the thing that I think video games, grinding in video games taught me was, you would be amazed what kinds of bananas grindery you would be willing to do for a meaningless outcome 
imagine <laughs> imagine if you there was a real outcome. Yeah, but my life has <laughs> yeah. such shitty graphics and sound effects. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all Mike's sound effects are <laughs> 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 Mike's got some rendering issues. Mike, that's yeah, green. Green. Mike, yeah. Mike. <laughs> like, did you, like, did you guys ever play the uh, the Fallout Shelter game? Yeah. You know, I just like like uh-huh. one day. I'm like, fur, yes, get yes, it. No way. Not for me. This game is not for yeah. me. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, there's really no way to have any kind of survivable vault unless you yeah. dump at least five bucks in. Yeah. Like, there's really no way. Yeah, like, that's also, how they get you. That's how they make any kind of money. There's really, if you want any kind of thing to survive, and a fraction you of your soul, and the good guns, and right? You, 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 like you only get money. this one life, right? How you have, we have a you, go ahead and calculate how many weeks left of yeah. existence you have left in front of you, and then decide how you want to spend that time. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a humbling okay. thought. E- easy math, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. The numbers like, get smaller. The math gets easier the older you get. <laughs> hey, right, mom. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah. oh, Jesus, Mike! My, my, mom, my mom's here. She's in the chat room. I'm just, you know. Wow. She... <laughs> God, talk about wasting her life. <laughs> go, Miss Capus. Go. Live free. Run away. Run away. Life. Stop watching this crap. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, Get that razor geez. blade down and go out. <laughs> Live. Jesus. <laughs> It's got, it's got done. Oh, RimWorld. I'm playing RimWorld right now, too. I'm just kidding. Mom just said okay. F you to both of us. <laughs> In the chat? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Oh, yeah. His, his mom watches this oh, show. There you it's go. funny. Hi, Mom. Yeah, I am. Fantastic. Oh, fantastic. All right, all right. Hey, we're running out of time. So um, I do want to mention we, we, we kind of glossed. We didn't get to it. I don't know how we didn't get to it, but we kind of glossed over real quick. But Astronomy Cast, tell us about Astronomy Cast real quick. Sure. So Astronomy Cast, uh, we've been doing this for 10 years, and it is a you know weekly podcast. And it's really a conversation with me and Dr. Pamela Gay, who's a PhD astronomer. And she is just kind of teaching me about the universe one topic at a time. And so each week we pull up a new topic, be it black holes or neutron stars or Milky Way or the strong nuclear force or uh, various exploration of Mars, etc. And she describes it in she's very patient and explains it to me and uh, and um and i am you know i'm sort of asking her all the questions and trying to understand things better and, and lead the conversation and people seem to really enjoy it and i think part of it is just that we that because it is a natural conversation it's just two people talking about a topic clearly i sort of am am driving the conversation and i'm, and I'm sort of leading where i'm sort of crafting a narrative in my brain as, as it comes out. But, but Pamela has no idea what questions I'm going to ask her. She has no idea oh, where really? the conversation is going to go. I oh, yeah, no, that. no. So there's no script. There's nothing. Well, the script, nice. the script is when I do the intro. But apart from that, she, has, she is in no way prepared for what I'm going to ask her. And I don't even know what I'm going to ask her, right? Because she'll explain something and I'll begin the journey down a new rabbit hole. So you're like, what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and so I think it's, it's you know, and now over the course of 10 years, right, of the, the 400 plus episodes that we've done, we've had a chance to cover every, really every nook and cranny of the universe. And so it's this way for people to to sort of understand it piece by piece, bit, bit at a time. Uh, universe yeah. is done, boys. <laughs> yeah, we're done. We're finished. But it, dude, I. I was I, I just to refresh just myself because I hadn't listened to you guys in a little while. Uh, my podcast time went down over the last couple of years, and uh, I've been trying to keep up with shows, but it's hard to do. So I made you know from prep for the show, I was like, oh yeah, I haven't listened okay. to an episode in a it's while. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. So I, so I went back. I listened to a couple episodes uh, just recently, um, and you guys were talking about uh, Voyager mm-hmm. and uh, how how. Voyager, I love Voyager one. It's like it's like one of my favorite things because you know it's the furthest thing out there, and. Um, it's and the it's farthest it's like, object in the solar system that we know of. Yeah, and it's not even in our solar system anymore, right? Is it is it well, officially out? It's well, kind of you, you, you know, it's all definition, right? It's it's right. exited the heliosphere, 
which is right. the sort of the area, the bubble that the sun creates around it with its solar wind, and that in interacts with the essentially the bubbles of all the other stars that are out there in the in the Milky Way, right. and and it has sort of pierced the membrane and gone out into interstellar space, but it's still within the gravitational field of the sun. The or it's okay. got to travel for another hundreds of years before it even reaches the Oort cloud. So no, it's going to be with us for a long time. And I, I learned something on that. You know, I, I do a lot of reading stuff on, on um, astronomy type of things. And I had, I had never put two and two together that the Oort cloud is actually as far out as it is. I thought, I thought that the Oort cloud was just right outside the heliosphere. And I guess in galactic terms, it is right outside of it. But, you know, that's all yeah, relative, well, the Oort, right? Yeah, the Oort cloud could extend out a light year from the Earth. Holy so shit. So it's gigantic. Okay. Yeah. So you're, okay. you know, the Kuiper belt is much closer, but the Oort cloud could be that far out. Okay. So when comets and stuff, when they say a comet came in from the Oort cloud, that is a journey. Yeah. It, it could have been making that journey for thousands of years before it made yep. its way into the inner solar system. Voyager's not nice. doing any kind of broadcasting anymore, right? There mm -hmm. is. Yeah. yeah. It is. The two, yeah, it is. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. I, so the most or the second. Episode two episodes ago over on our YouTube channel, I did a, a big episode about the Voyagers. But yeah, they are still broadcasting. Um, they both have the amount, their power is about the equivalent of a, like the power of their transmitter is about the equivalent of a, of a light bulb, like a refrigerator light bulb. Mm -hmm. But it's a billionth of a billionth of a watt is being received on Earth. But no, they're still communicating with them. They're still transmitting signals to them. They're still receiving science. 40 years yeah. they've been going. Dude, it's amazing. Because, like, th what I imagine, all right, like, in my little pea brain, what I imagine when I when I see that thing floating out there just, just zooming about, I hear, like, days, days. Like, you know what I mean? It's, like, shutting down or about <laughs> yeah, to die. It is. It is. And, that, and that's absolutely happening. That the You know, it's uh, the radio thermal isotope generator is – slowing down the amount of power that it's putting out the amount of electronics that they can power up are, are going down it, it made it 40 years it's that's probably amazing. not going to make it 50 years but that's so amazing oh, wow. we are within its final couple of years of life probably for the two of them for both of them yeah right Dude, actually, I actually learned something think... about the about the Voyagers which, that I didn't even know, and someone in the comments had sort of mentioned this. That when they when they flew the Voyagers, like Voyager two was the one that did the grand tour and went to Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune and, and out. Voyager one only did uh, Jupiter and Saturn, and then it did a flyby of Titan. And so they and but but to do that flyby of Titan, it couldn't do the the rest of the grand tour, and so it just went out into space. But it turns out that they actually had a bit of a a choice to make they could have made a flyby uh they could have done a slingshot around saturn and then gone out to pluto and so they decided that titan is the more interesting target for voyager than pluto was but when it got close to titan which was what they ended up choosing it was too hazy for them to see the surface hmm. so ironically if they had chosen pluto they would have seen images of pluto Back in the nineties, wow. that's that like piece? me you going to all north... the way out there, and then it's cloudy. There, it's, it's cloudy, yeah, and it was right? cloudy. <laughs> Bring it around. <laughs> they, they, they took the risk, and in the end, right. it didn't pay off. Right, right, right. That's, that's funny. <laughs> All right, all right, all right. Let's wrap this puppy up. Hey, but uh, but but Frazier, can you stick around for about fifteen more minutes? Because we got a game we like to play. We got one, and, and Mike has crafted a game. And Jack, you'll like this. It's uh, it's one of Mike's games, but Frazier's our age, so it'll work. That's right. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -oh. So. <laughs> okay. So, good. Uh, anyway, so make sure you check out uh, universetoday.com uh, and then youtube.com universe today. Mm -hmm. And you can follow Frazier uh, on Twitter at F Kane. That's F C A I N. Um, and Frazier, do you do you tweet much? Are you a, do you do much of that? No, I no. answer <laughs> tweets, so. but I don't. I don't read. He answers I his tweets. I, that's how I got him on the show. I I tweeted I at him. <laughs> Yeah, I, right. I I answer the tweets. I don't read the Twitters much. It sort of falls okay. into that same yeah. bucket as uh, as buying donuts to build the quickie mart. 
Yeah. You know what? I, I You were talking about Instagram all the way. I see you as, as what you – for what you do, Instagram is more of a, a vehicle. Instagram and Facebook, right? Would you say? Uh, Sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Right. Yeah. Fantastic. I, I, we can have a whole other conversation about what I think about social media. So <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, we'll just – So fine. yeah. We Instagram, probably think a lot. <laughs> yeah. If you are yeah. – uh, you know, if you are a photographer and it's – you know, it's, it's where all the cool kids are hanging out right now. So we're on Instagram. Definitely do it. Okay. Yeah. Not it's Snapchat. We hate we hate <laughs> Snapchat. We hates it. <laughs> Precious. <laughs> okay. Snapchat is the oh, it's the devil. All right. Thanks, Fresh, for coming on. Stick around for the game, but uh until that time. Uh you've just enjoyed another awesome episode of the Mythwits Podcast. Catch us live on Twitch Mondays at 9:30 p.m. Eastern Time. Jump to the chat room and ask our guests questions if you dare. Uh we had a few tonight. Fantastic. Thanks for participating. If you miss our live show, you can always catch the encore episodes at YouTube forward slash Mythwits. Find us at Mythwits.com on Facebook, Twitch, Twitter, Podbean as Mythwits. Podbean, that's our podcast. Subscribe. Do like, follow, subscribe thing wherever. It's appropriate please give us a bunch of stars and a review on itunes we could use that you know uh screenshot it post on our facebook page and i'll personally send something special as a matter of fact we have a promotion going on so if you do a couple things for us uh we will send you stuff you can pick from our page jack contributed a bunch of nice stuff to it you can pick it out and I'll send it to you free of charge if you're in the United Very States. Nice. Mythwits is part of the TSR Podcast Network. If you like us, you're bound to like the other great shows there. Check out TSRPN.com. Mythwits is a Creative Commons product. Make sure to check it out on Studio187.com for more cool stuff and join our mailing list. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Tell your friends to tune in. And until next week, Mike. Hey, look, Pete. I made myself Pikachu on Snapchat.